First lesson of our agrarian revolt, the West, post-Civil War, expansion, manifest destiny, kicking into another gear, a higher gear, a second gear. We have to settle everything out beyond that Mississippi River. It's already in progress, but now we're just going to finish it off. How is it that mining, ranching, and farming in that time period really helps develop and settle the West? And what does the United States government do to promote their growth? We looked at this particular image to kind of talk about and think about the environment and geography there. It's more challenging to say the least out in the West. The government's going to try to help do some things to make it more advantageous or attractive to move into the West. Life is tough. We're in the Gilded Age, this 19, 1865 to 1900 time period. It's our second industrial revolution. It's kicked off by the Civil War and the need for materials to wage war. Uh, there's union growth, labor, factory workers, industrialism, railroads are the most important thing we need to focus on right now. Uh, immigrants uh, coming in from southern and eastern Europe to work in factories. Uh, the Reconstruction is in this time period as well. We just covered that, and there's going to be a major shift and a major growth of a political movement in this unit and in this time period that is significant for a very long time to come. There's another visual that kind of reflects everything going on. There's a lot of stuff here. It takes us a while to get out of this half of the century, but today and right now we're going to look at mining. The first thing to really establish itself and settle the West and help establish statehood in the West. Uh, the development of the cowboy culture in the cattle kingdom in that order, followed by farming and the farming boom. All three of these are aided by railroads and the development of railroads into the West, bring resources from the West back to the hungry markets of the East where industry and major populations are. If you remember, in 1848, the California gold rush started bringing a large number of people over to the West Coast, vastly increased the supply of gold in the world. And once it kind of settled down and was played out, people started floating out in the rest of the West to look for gold and silver, lead, other precious minerals. 1859, put a star by that. That is a pretty important date. There is a major, massive vein and resource of silver discovered at what becomes the Comstock Lode in Nevada. That's going to increase the world's silver supply significantly, and it also is going to impact money and the money situation. It's going to be an important thing. We'll talk about that later. Uh, but as we find mineral resources or there's word of a mineral resource or gold or silver being found somewhere, all of a sudden these boom towns pop up and appear overnight. People rush to these particular areas. There's buildings, there's churches, there's bars, uh, stores to buy all the things that miners need just popping up overnight. And there's really no government to really control the crowds or to deal with uh criminal acts, things like that. So a common person takes things into their own hand and vigilante justice tends to be the common thing uh, in the what would be termed by some the Wild West. And uh, you may not even be involved in anything criminal, but you could have been mentioned as the person and that would be enough to get you hung from a tree perhaps. As soon as the resource in the minerals were played out, people just disperse just about that fast and ghost towns develop there's nobody there anymore. So it's a really fluid kind of a time period and area, and it's also very ruckus and very dangerous as well. It's a tough life out in the West. And the economy that we have here, as you can see, uh, in the West is developed here with mining out in this region. A significant amount of agriculture and cattle ranching in this particular region in the middle. And then we have the railroads connecting it, bringing it from east to west and manufacturing products back again, right? Everybody has a little bit of something to offer and need from another region of the country. Mining initially was about individual prospectors, people coming with their pack animal, their shovels, their pans, and they're in the rivers and in the streams, but pretty soon big companies and corporations develop and they start really getting after the mineral resources out there. And what develops and results is a significant amount of pollution. There are no rules and regulations for any of this stuff. Uh, they conflict with farmers uh, and ranchers who need a clean water supply, uh, water supplies that get uh, contaminated by high pressure water hoses that are used to blast mineral resources out of the sides of hills and mountains and that causes other minerals and multiple minerals to mix together to form toxic substances that wash into rivers and streams, it kills people, it kills cows. Uh, there's conflict here and all that. Right away there's a, a negative impact on the environment. In getting into our cowboy 
kingdom, the cow kingdom. It has significant Spanish roots. The whole image of the cowboy with the chaps, the hat, uh, the lassos, uh, all that kind of thing that tends to be portrayed by Hollywood, it's all Spanish in origin. And as Americans move into the West, it basically becomes taken over by American pop culture, uh, American literature at that time. Uh, it gets uh, engrandized as being something completely American, and we start seeing it in films in, history, in Hollywood uh, later on down the line. Uh, and uh, this uh, whole uh, culture just kind of gets lost in it be being anything involving, you know, Spanish culture, New Spain, and or people from um, uh, the region of what is present day Mexico and the southern, southern part of the United States, uh, and it becomes an American thing. Make sure you read your Vaquero article. It does a great job of talking about how that all played out. And so uh, everything becomes Americanized, kind of another uh, effect of manifest destiny. And who were they? Well, a large number of them tended to be Confederate soldiers especially the cowboys, the cowboy culture, especially uh, prevalent in the southern Great Plains, also in the northern Great Plains as well, but especially in the southern Great Plains. African Americans, large numbers of them were, were cowboys, uh, and of course most of them being uh, Mexican in background and origin. Uh, the vaqueros were those individual cowboys that worked uh, for ranchers taking care of their cattle on what would be known as an open range. Uh, and the open range was really government land that uh, was all on the other side of the Mississippi River, and uh, it was not fenced off. It wasn't owned to anybody. It was owned by the government, and if you were out there and you had cows, and the Texas Longhorn was the cow of choice, cattle of choice, it was really tough, it was rugged, it could uh, operate in an arid climate. Uh, you could just have as many cows as you wanted because there's all kinds of grass to feed on. You fatten them up, and you all of a sudden then move them to market, and you move them to market from the southern Great Plains uh, into the northern Great Plains uh, to places like Cheyenne on these long drives that would happen, uh, nothing to get in the way at all, and then they throw them on a railroad train and they ship them off to major markets like Chicago, the biggest meatpacking plant facility I think perhaps ever in history perhaps. Uh, but this is where everything is being chopped up into everyone's steak. Look at that one. There's a steak in the shape of the United States. Uh, this long drive goes on for a number of years, and there's a lot of money to be made with that. Uh, and it's connecting something that the people in the East really didn't have a lot of before, and that is beef. Beef tended to be a, a staple of the upper classes, affordable only to the upper classes. Well, now the supply is increasing so it brings down the price more people can eat it lower classes before this tended to eat pork chicken maybe animals that they hunted or raised on their own farm uh, but uh, for big exploding uh, exploding cities uh, with exploding populations uh, this was a big deal and it provided massive numbers of jobs in these meatpacking plants uh, on these open ranges there was conflict between farmers uh, of different types and ranchers, uh, farmers and ranchers of different types. Uh, I highly encourage you to go ahead and Google a particular cartoon called Drag Along Droopy. It highlights Droopy as a sheep rancher. Sheep tended to eat the grass uh, so intensively that it would act they would actually pull it from the root out of the ground and kill the grass. And for big, massive animals like cattle, they need a lot of grass. And so the uh, ranch uh, cattle ranchers would be fighting and attacking uh, the sheep ranchers in order to become range wars. And even this would happen between farmers and other cattle ranchers. Check out the movie trailer on Open Range with Kevin Costner as well. Does a good job of kind of highlighting what was going on out there. So there's conflict over the use of the land for the settlers that were there. Uh, but ranching is going to die primarily because of the invention of something called barbed wire. I'll review who in, invented that here in a little bit. But also because of some harsh winters and droughts in the late 1880s. There was one in 1887 called the Great Die Up that killed off about 90% of the open range cattle. Uh, it was such a severe winter and, and, and snowfall. Uh, but this, this barbed wire, if you look over here, if you extend that barbed wire fence across those cattle lines, those dotted, dotted uh, uh, trails right there, cattle going to the north, uh, they would have to cut those fences. And those fences were loved by farmers who were trying to protect crops. But when they get cut, they have conflict over them between the ranchers and the farmers. And so increasingly, as more farmers come into the west, increasing amounts of fencing gets put up and put in the way of the cattle drives. And then that big blizzard and those massive droughts in the, in, in the late 1880s kind of kills off 
those cattle drives. And cattle is still are still there, cattle ranching is still there, but the drives don't happen anymore. Uh, it's just basically people raising cattle in a particular area, and they throw them on the railroads that increase in number in that particular area to provide access to the eastern markets. But this uh, region of the Great Plains is uh, known as the Great American Desert. It's quite arid and dry. It's not a desert, but it is more definitely more arid than in the uh, in the east, where there's plentiful plentiful rainfall, and it's really isolated. Uh, settlers uh, made a uh, Account, uh, recounted uh, how uh, quite often for weeks or months they wouldn't see another uh, person to talk to. And some of them went kind of uh, crazy because they didn't have anybody else to talk to, but it's a very desolate and lonely life. About 1.6 million homesteads were granted by the United States government in the Homestead Act. Only 40% stayed. It was so difficult. Uh, and if they stayed for five years, they could get that free land. Uh, and again, all this movement and activity, again, is supported by uh, the government passing legislation like the Homestead Act, free access, cheap access to uh, access to cheap land, and the Railroad Act that helps make it economically viable to get goods and resources from one side to the other. The Moral Land Grant Act, you read about that a little bit more, and we'll also take a look at the reservation system that gets Native Americans out of the way also. But the specific Railway Act does uh, help establish, in the middle of the Civil War, the uh, building of the first transcontinental railroad to connect the coast and the regions of the country by Lincoln, the Republican Congress. Uh, its first completion is at Promontory Point, Utah, and there are basically two companies, uh, one that uses Chinese labor heavily to build it, the Central Pacific, and the other one using Irish labor heavily to build it from the eastern side, there's the term union here, uh, makes it happen. They make it happen very fast. In fact, they did it so quickly that the railroad was so poor of in quality, they had to rebuild the rail railroad initially because it was about getting money per mile of track. Uh, but these railroad companies not only got money for building the railroad, they got the land for free from the United States government for the railroad itself. And the question becomes, what do they do with this land? Now, it's just not a, a little skinny strip of land. It's a wide strip of land. And this I'll be showing in the map here in a second that shows it a little bit better than what you see here. But if you look at where some of these companies are, there is a Union Pacific here, and there's a, Union, a Northern Pacific there, and then there's uh, another one down here. Uh, these railroads control huge areas. And if you're a small farmer living in these areas off of that railroad line, who else do you use to get your goods to market or to get the things from eastern factories to maybe buy, uh, operate your, your your farm to maybe get lumber from anywhere else because there's no trees out there, uh, it has to go in on that railroad. And so what does that railroad do? They charge whatever they want. They basically have a monopoly. This is one of our problems we talked about with our farmers that we researched already. This map shows a little bit better uh, in, in the degree to which these uh, railroad companies got land. Huge, wide swaths of land. They're not going to build a railroad on every single part of it, so what do they do with it? Again, they might be building off some, some, some railroad lines off into the edges and off to the, off to the sides here. They're definitely doing that, but there's more land than you really need to build a railroad. So what do you do with it? Here's another shot of it. You sell it. You sell it to immigrants who are being told in Europe, come get free land, Homestead Act, you can be a farmer, it's the land of milk and honey, the Garden of Eden, you can grow anything out there. Americans from the east are moving out there, farmers from the east are moving out there uh, to get, take advantage of all this, uh, and the railroads get money also from the sale of the land. What makes the land productive? Well, technology is happening uh, and, and coming along and has been developing before this to help the Great Plains become successfully farmed. Uh, the McCormick Reaper, seen here, helps uh, get the crops off the field uh, in large amounts to feed large numbers of hungry people in the East. Uh, the steel plow was especially more tough than an iron plow. It didn't break because of the hard soil conditions out here on the Great Plains. Uh, and then once you planted things, you could then separate massive amounts of grain, the grain itself from the stock, to bag it up and then get it out to the market to be sold. What does that do to the supply? Well, the supply obviously 
goes up significantly. This reduces prices. Uh, we also know that there is competition from foreign countries as well. The prices go down because of the fact that some of these farmers uh, have debt, not only be, uh, primarily because they're buying some of this new equipment, but they also have to take out debt to buy seeds, to buy food supplies and things like that. Uh, that means that they eventually go bankrupt, especially when economic depressions happen. So uh, between new technology and government policy, the supply of the crops really go up and the prices really come down. And farmers do what they know how to do, and that is grow more. Again, government policy is helping a lot of this explosive growth in the farming market. Uh, there's also new methods of farming that are developed here on what becomes known as the wheat belt. And one of them is dry farming. Since it's arid uh, out there, they plant the seed a little deeper into the soil to get closer to the moisture, moisture so it uh, germinates and it sprouts. Uh, there's also the development of uh, the windmill. You can still see those out there today if you travel out there to basically uh, dig a well and pump it out through wind power uh, for cattle and for people. Uh, this is making life out there much more viable. But this wheat belt that develops is uh, especially characterized by a neat type of farm. In fact, it's almost like a factory or industrial farm. Uh, some of these farmers get huge amounts and tracts of land uh, through the Homestead Act, and they uh, hire other workers, and they buy huge numbers of horses and reapers and plows, and they basically send out an army, just plow and plow all day and harvest and harvest all day, driving up the supply of these crops again even more further driving them down in price. But they have huge profits uh, for a brief period of time until panic hits. Uh, in the 1870s and in the 1880s, 1890s, uh, more and more farms are going to go out of business because of economic depression on top of the oversupply of the goods. And uh, this economic stress is going to move us to organize, or we should say our farmers to organize to try and do something about their problems. Again, we looked at some of those problems. We'll talk about how they organize next class. Uh, again, 1880s, there's disaster. Besides the massive uh, um, blizzards that are happening in the late 1880s, uh, there's drought. Crops are destroyed. Crops are destroyed. You can't pay your debts. You just can't live out there. Uh, competition with other nations is growing, as we mentioned before. Again, a good picture of the open range. Uh, farmers only react when this happens by doing what farmers know how to do, and that is grow more, the price drops more, take out a mortgage to maybe buy more land and or equipment to harvest more, and also to buy uh, the soil and the seed and the supplies to plant the crop. Uh, the supply goes up everywhere because all farmers are generally doing that, and uh, the price continues to come down and more and more people lose their farms and they become tenant farmers renting from other farmers that somehow are able to kind of hang on. Uh, keep in mind, again, technology is a factor in killing off some aspects of the uh, cattle industry, and that is this barbed wire thing we talked about before. Joseph Glidden is the guy that comes up with a modern, inventive version of it, uh, and it's going to kill the long drive to the north. It's a big deal. More industry developed out of this, and jobs developed out of this. But farmers love those uh, particular things to protect their crops, or they barbed wire to protect their crops and keep cattle out. Of course, this is sharp, right? So it's kind of irritating for an animal when they run into it. Uh, but more and more, uh, the cattle industry in the West is being, uh, uh, the cattle industry is being dri driven out by this and natural disasters and uh, the technology that is allowing farmers to protect their crops. And they're coming in larger, larger numbers because of the Homestead Act and because of the railroads uh, and because of technology enabling to be more productive farmers, even though they don't make a lot of money off of this, and increasingly so. Well, again, as I mentioned before, this is the haymaking unit. Make enough hay, you might be able to become a member of the National Haymakers Association. Get after it. Have a good day. See you next time.